Good morning. This is Steve. Glad to see you today. <clears throat> Welcome to Fairfield Seventh-day Adventist Church, where we're dedicated to Christ's ministry of providing protection, promoting healing, and restoring relationship. In text talks, we're looking at Bible passages related to the companion pieces in the Sabbath devotionals. This is a companion piece for the Sabbath devotional uh, dumped. So you might want to check on that to, uh, to get the story behind the story. So here we're going to look at some Bible passages dealing with how Jesus dealt with immoral people. He had a very strong sense of morality, yet it brought him into repeated conflict not with the secular society he was surrounded with, but by the religious people. And today I want to look us to look at passages that are stories of how he dealt with people that the religious community defined as immoral. And I think by doing so we might develop some insights both into his thinking and into how it can be applied to our lives. So, how did Jesus relate with immoral people? Let me grab my Bible, and I suggest that you do the same. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, and I'm going to read verses 9 through 13. And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he saith unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what this meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Matthew was a tax collector. He was an IRS agent. But he was an IRS agent in a situation that's very different from what we have here in the United States. He was an IRS agent as a collaborator with the occupying forces. He was a traitor. Not the kind of person that religious people usually associate with. In fact, we go to great distances trying to prove that we aren't compromised, that we are members of our communities. Almost every denomination has apologized for its collaboration with the fascist regimes in Europe during the World War II era. And yet here Jesus is actively including a known collaborator in his inner circle of disciples. And not only that, he lets these collaborators come and associate with him and his disciples. Now, when I was a young man, when I was a teenager, and my parents and my, my teachers were trying to, to educate me in how to live an upright moral life, one of the things that they taught me is that you have to be careful who you associate with. Even as a mature adult, that's a principle that 
is impressed on me repeatedly in my business, in my work dealings, in my social relationships. Who you associate affects your reputation, and so you have to be careful, right? And yet here Jesus is associating with collaborators, traitors, dishonest businessmen, and sinners. Other, other places in the Gospels, it mentions prostitutes. Prostitutes and corrupt businessmen and politicians were coming to eat with Jesus. Now, if your pastor had people like this in and out of his house day after day, how do you think your church would respond? No wonder the Pharisees took, took umbrage against Jesus. Okay, Matthew 8, 1 to 4. So we're going to step back a chapter. Matthew 8, another story of Jesus. And when he came down from the mountains, great mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cured. And Jesus said to him, See thou tell no man, but go thy way, show thyself to that priest, and offer the gift that Moses commandeth for a testimony unto them. Lepers were considered unclean religiously. In fact, in the Old Testament, if you touched a letter, leper. No, if you even sat on a chair that a leper had sat on, or touched a piece of clothing that a leper had touched, you were religiously unclean. And there was a specified period of time where that you had to quarantine yourself, and then you had to go through a testing ritual and a cleansing ritual, and you had to offer a sacrifice. Touching a leper was not something religious people did because of the stigma and the inconvenience that it incurred. And yet Jesus touched the leper. Now, I've heard people say, well, he could touch him because he knew that as soon as he touched him, he'd be cured and then he wouldn't have to deal with this. I'm sure that the Pharisees looking on um, thought about that. Okay. Um, no, they would have split hairs. You touched a leper. You touched a leper. Follow the law. Do what's right. Their moral code demanded this religious ritual. Jesus didn't follow those norms. He interacted with people. All right, I keep uh, changing things unnecessarily here. Okay, so Matthew, reading on in Matthew uh, five through thirteen, Matthew eight five through thirteen. So after the leper incident, and when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him, saying and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldst come under my roof, but speak the word 
only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth. And to another, Come, and he cometh. And to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing and teeth. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. So we've dealt with the collaborator. We've dealt with prostitutes. We've dealt with lepers. Now we're dealing with the occupying forces. See, the centurion was not there as a friend of the Jews. He was there to force their submission to the Roman occupation. I, in my experience, okay, I grew up at the tail end of the Vietnam War. There were Vietnamese who were friendly to our GIs, but they lived in constant danger. Uh, then we've got the, um, the occupation of Iraq and Afghanistan. Very similar situation, except in all three of those cases, they were a temporary occupying force, whereas the Romans, there was nothing temporary about this. This was permanent. There was, there was no facade of, oh, we've come to liberate you. No, they were there to occupy. And yet, Jesus said to the people around him, including his disciples and including the Pharisees and who were constantly watching him and following him, trying to catch him in some, some misstatement, he said to them, this man has more faith than you. That's a bizarre statement, isn't it? I mean, would you call an occupying soldier a moral person? Well, that's a loaded question because um, if we're the occupation, then we think of ourselves as moral. But if our nation had been occupied, had been conquered, and there were military garrisons in every town and soldiers patrolling the street, we would have a different perspective. And yet Jesus, Jesus called him good. He was amazed at his faith. John chapter 8, verses 1 through 3 is perhaps the classic of Jesus dealing with immoral people. He's in church, worshiping. And the pastor, the deacons, and the elders all troop into the sanctuary, dragging with them a weeping woman. Jesus went into the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down, and he taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. You can read the rest of the story, okay? Uh, this woman is brought in, caught in the act of adultery. And they want judgment pass, okay? How do you deal with adultery in the church?
scribes and Pharisees had a very clear plan in mind. Stoner. Now today we we're, we're against the death penalty. Okay, we're we're more civilized than this, so we just kick her out, send her on her way, ban her from the premises. She's a bad apple. Dangerous woman. Yeah, keep her away from her. We don't want our young men associating with her. How did Jesus treat her? Number one, he defended her against her accusers with no repentance on her part, with no statement, I'm going to reform. I didn't want to do this. No, without question. He defended her against her accusers. And when they had left, and he asked her who was still there that was condemning her as she's huddled on the ground, she finally looks up and looks around and says, no one. And he says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now, he calls her to repentance. He points her down a path. But he doesn't condemn her. He doesn't threaten her with hellfire. He doesn't tell her what her outcome is going to be if she does not repent. He just invites her to repent. How different from the way he treats the scribes and Pharisees in Matthew 23. Now we could go out through other stories of how Jesus dealt with people that the religious leaders of his day considered immoral. In Matthew 23, Jesus is talking to the scribes and Pharisees. And he's not too, not very gentle with them, starting with verse 13. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against them. Ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. And then he goes on to list specific examples of their hypocrisy. They take widows' houses as offerings and then make a pretense of long public prayers. In other words, they're very, very, very faithful in their religious rituals. But when it comes to faith and mercy, to grace and mercy, they don't consider it important. In verse um, 28, he sums it up. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous, but within you're full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Why does morality have a bad rap in our society today? I would put forward the assertion that it's because very many of us both members and leaders are fairly well described by what Jesus says here in verse 28. We make a show of religion, but when the rubber meets the road, our lives are full of hypocrisy and sin. So when the spiritual but not religious say they want nothing to do with religion, that's what they're saying. I don't want to be like you. I don't want to act like you. And I'm afraid that Jesus would agree so before we start condemning those who 
rebel against our morality. And before we start fighting cultural wars to force that morality on others, maybe we need to look at our own hearts, our own lives. Maybe we need to come to the cross. Maybe we need to be called to repentance. And when our lives are transformed, the very people that we think are immoral may find a safe haven in our presence. Have a good day, friends. Think on these things, but more than that, look up.